So here on a Thursday, it feels like Friday for some reason, at the European Geosciences uh, Union General Assembly in Vienna on a beautiful day. I'm with the principal investigator for one of NASA's most impressive mission, the Juno mission to Jupiter and its moons. And Scott Bolton, who is a planetary scientist at SWRI in San Antonio, Texas, is here. We've been discussing the little appreciated or perhaps underappreciated moon of Io, one of the Galilean moons of Io, first discovered by Galileo back in the day. And uh, Juno has just, I don't know, when did it make the two flybys, uh, Scott? Uh, December 2024 and again in February 2025. And you were... Uh, or no, wait a minute, I'm sorry. T December 2023 and February 2024. And you're extended, and it's not going to make any more flybys of of, of EO. But, no, it won't. Okay. But uh, you learn quite a bit uh, from all 10 instruments which are still working on Juno, correct? Even Absolutely. The... And we are, even from afar, we continue to monitor it. So we can monitor the volcanoes from afar. We're tens of thousands of kilometers away. But we can still image, and, and in fact, next week we'll take another shot at seeing if the big volcanic eruption that we just saw is still active. And you were telling me that the thing that probably impressed you the most, we're here today living on a relative Val Valhalla, uh, which is just a paradise made for us. Uh, well, it evolved to be a, you know, a, a great place to live. But yet you have two of the most extreme examples of planetary science within our grasp, Jupiter itself and Io, and describe the, how different they are and why they are such a dichotomy. So those are two extremes, two end members. So Jupiter is, you know, the largest of all the planets that are in our solar system. It's more massive than all the other planets put together. So it's an extreme. Everything about it is extreme. It's a monster. It's got the strongest magnetic field, the largest gravity field, um, the, the most you know ferocious aurora. Um, just everything about it is extreme. There's harshest radiation belts in the entire solar system. And then sitting in the same system is another extreme object, Io, which is the most volcanic body in the solar system. So there's nothing in our solar system that we have seen that has so many volcanoes all going off at the same time continuously, and hundreds of them. And it's about the size of our moon, you think? Uh, and when it erupts, these volcanoes, they spew their gas and vol volcanic uh, dust or whatever, a magma, thousands, maybe a thousand, a couple of thousand, kilometers uh, above the surface, but there's so little gravity that a lot of it, you said, escapes, correct? So the, the plumes are, are the plumes. quite high. I mean, you have this volcanic eruption and a plume goes up, and it, and it goes up high enough that some of it escapes. In other words, it's, it leaves EO altogether because the gravity field of EO is quite small. Some of it falls back down, but some of it just goes out and fills Jupiter's magnetosphere. Now, that's like that's this magnetic field whipping around. Jupiter spins in 10 hours. So it's got this the largest planet in our solar system, and its day is only 10 hours. And it has the strong magnetic field. So it's like an engine going around. And that engine is being fed by this small, tiny moon, which is constantly spewing out material that is filling its gas, but it just fills this and becomes ionized and, and just feeds this giant magnetosphere. So this tiny moon is having really big effects on this giant planet. But this also goes the other way, doesn't it? I mean, because the gravitational forces are driving the interior volcanism, right? That's exactly right. So as as EO goes around Jupiter, its its orbit is a little bit off being perfectly circular. So, so Jupiter is basically squeezing it relentlessly, just constantly squeezing its insides, causing them to melt and erupt with volcanoes. It's called tidal force. And you described, someone in the press release described, there was a press release that came from a press conference yesterday, which I was not able to attend, but it described the mechanism 
someone like a car radiator or what was it? A generator or something? Inside? It's like an engine, right? An it, engine. Is, it is like an engine, or very much like that. And that, the whole magnetosphere is like an engine because there's, there's all these currents going around and everything's spinning really fast. And EO itself is a little bit like an engine because it's constantly being squeezed and the insides are, are very hot and molten and eventually erupt, uh, you know. So scientifically, why is studying EO important? So, you know, studying phenomena on, on a planet uh, or a moon that uh, it has some phenomena that's very similar to right here on the Earth. So we're trying to understand how nature works. And in particular, you'd like to understand how Earth works. So there's volcanoes here. They're quite dangerous. They affect us a lot. We have kind of an idea of how volcanoes work. We see volcanic activity, you know, at a, at a smaller route happened on Venus and Mars, you know, old things like that. Here's this thing that's constantly spewing out volcanoes. And so by studying this, we can learn about the volcanoes here on the Earth, what's similar, what's different, what are the conditions that cause these things. And one example is we have this instrument that we invented basically to look at through Jupiter's atmosphere into the, uh, below the cloud tops. And when we pointed it at EO, we saw into the rock and lava. And we didn't really realize that, that we were going to be able to do that. It was somewhat serendipity. But now that we see that this instrument called a microwave radiometer can actually see into below the rock and the crusts into lava that's underneath these thin crusts that are cooling on the lava lakes, um, the question is, is, could we use that on the Earth to monitor our own volcanoes and learn how they work? So we're looking at maybe we should fly one of these instruments right here at Earth and study our own volcanoes. And this microwave radiometer was invented for Ju the Juno mission. Is that right. correct? That's right. I mean, radiometers have been around a long time, but we invented a special one in order to look below the cloud tops of Jupiter and understand its composition, the dynamics of its storms. And it turns out that when you point it toward EO or the ice on Europa and Ganymede, you're able to see into that. So it provided the first real look inside of the subsurface structure of EO. And we eventually realized that we could actually see into the lava. And let's uh, think about all the wonderful science we've already gotten from Juno. It's about a, a $1.2 billion mission, chicken feed to a lot of people here on Earth. Uh, uh, well, it truly is. You're an extended mission until the end of 2025, and you hope that Juno will have a further extension. Is that right? That's right. We did, we did put together another three-year extension that would allow us to study, go in further into the rings and inner moon area, which is not well explored. And we're waiting to, to hear if that's going to be, um, you know, provided Provide. so that we can Provide. continue the mission. So let's just end by um, talking about NASA and its brilliant job of navigating and and micromanaging these orbits to get within 1,500 kilometers of EO. Amazing feat in an elliptical orbit. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, so to me, uh, one of the greatest things that we've been able to do as, as humans is figure out how to navigate around the planets and stars. And I'm totally amazed when I first got to JPL, which is a NASA center in Pasadena, California, that they could basically fly between the planets, fly to go visit Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and even once there, go into orbit and navigate around the moons, just like you're driving down to the store to the gas station. It's unbelievable. It's amazing that we are able to, to, to apply the knowledge that we've learned over many, many years of physics and math and actually fly these spacecraft to go visit other places. And also do it robotically with a time difference. Absolutely. You can do it robotically. Eventually, maybe someday we send people. But I mean, the, the whole concept that we could understand the gravity fields and navigation, you're, you're, in one sense, it seems like it makes sense because you're navigating by the stars the same way we used to do it with the old ancient ships. But it, now I'm navigating between bodies of the solar system. And if I'm not incorrect, the Galilean moons were used by Lewis and Clark on their trek west to, to give a crude uh, estimate on longitude. Am I wrong in that, or do you remember? That I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the audience will just have to trust me on that one. You can look it up on, 
but uh, on Google or something. But anyway, Scott, thanks so much. Uh, congratulations on a great mission. When will you hear about the extended funded? funded? Uh, I'm not sure when that will happen, but uh, hopefully soon. Um, our current extended mission uh, is scheduled to end at the end of September 2025. And if that mission is ended in 2025, what happens to the spacecraft? So uh, the spacecraft would eventually uh, fall into Jupiter, um, but it would be uh, maybe tens of years, decades before that'll happen. So essentially you would just shut it off and, and it will, and uh, nothing bad would happen to it, but eventually it will fall into, into Jupiter. All right, well, thank you very much, Scott. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you.